Welcome to another speaker series event brought to you by the Cultural Knowledge Consortium. The CKC is a joint interagency effort of the U.S. government to support the development of sociocultural knowledge and facilitate knowledge exchange across a range of sociocultural communities of interest. Contact information, the CKC blog, discussion forums, and other resources are available on the CKC web portal at ckc.army.mil. You will also find a link to recordings of all speaker series presentations on the CKC YouTube channel. You may submit questions using the chat, question and answer pod in the lower portion of your screen at any time. We'll respond to as many as time allows. Content of this presentation should not be construed as advocacy, nor representing the views of the CKC or the U.S. government. This presentation is unclassified and intended for public release. Enjoy this presentation. And good morning or good afternoon, depending on what time of time you're in. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and welcome you to another CKC Speaker Series event. This is a special one. This is a, a discussion panel with multiple participants. And uh, if anybody gets disconnected at any time, please just come back in. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody hears this. Today, our, our special guests are Dr. Claire Metellitz. She is a regional and functional scholar here at the C Cultural Knowledge Consortium. Uh, she brings with her uh, uh, Mr. Jacob Zen and Mr. Michael Olafemi Sadipo. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome, thank our guests, and turn the presentation over to them at this time. Uh, Dr. Metellitz, the floor is yours. Let me move this out of the way and enjoy. Thanks, Jay. Boko Haram was formed in Nigeria's northeastern Borno state in 2002. The Islamic Jihadist group has been responsible for over 4,000 deaths. Boko Haram's founder, Mohammed Youssef, initially preached of cleansing Nigeria of Western influence, particularly in education and secular institutions. While Youssef urged the group to follow the example of Osama bin Laden, the group did not start to carry out military operations until 2009, after Yusuf was killed. Since then, Boko Haram has declared loyalty to Al-Qaeda and launched an insurgency, and the group continues to adopt new tactics. It evades security forces, it's, a, it's advancing its objectives through assassinations, kidnappings, and massacres of populations. It has also begun to factionalize and spread into Cameroon and Niger. Today, I'd like to welcome Mr. Michael Sidipu, who is, who is reporting to us from Kano, Nigeria. Uh, Mr. Sidipu is the founder and project coordinator of Peace Initiative Network, an NGO that focuses on peace building and good governance in Nigeria. Our other panelist, who is a repeat performer here at CKC, is Mr. Jacob Zen. He's an analyst of African and Eurasian affairs at the Jamestown Foundation in Washington, DC. Both of these presenters have written extensively on Boko Haram. So welcome, gentlemen, and uh, welcome to our international audience. And uh, before we start on questions, I would like to ask Mr. Zen to start uh, with a brief presentation and overview of Boko Haram. If we could put the slides up for Jacob, that'd be great. Uh, Jake, I've got no sound on you. Can make sure that you're unmuted. Hello, everyone. I wanted to uh, thank Dr. Medelitz and uh, Michael uh, for being here today, for inviting me, and to echo Dr. Medelitz's statement that uh, it's great to be with Michael because he's a peace, re peace researcher and activist on the ground in Nigeria, in Kano. And if the US and Nigeria are to ever make progress on this area of mutual interest, which is to scale back the Boko Haram insurgency, it's going to require a collaboration. Uh, with people on the ground, just like Michael. So uh, I want to start off by just sharing a very brief intel 
uh, overview of Boko Haram and Ansaru. I think the key distinction that we need to know is that Boko Haram is a grassroots insurgency in Nigeria, although it has received weapons and other forms of financial support from abroad, from Sudan, from Saudi, and possibly even UK-linked Islamist groups. Ansaru is really a creation of Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb, which was an Algerian-based group. Since about 2003, Nigerians have been training in the Sahel with Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb. Within the last five years, Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb started allowing its sub-Saharan African brigades to become more independent. And this, you know, first you had a Mukhtar al Mukhtar, who is sort of a, you know, a mobile fox roaming around the Sahel. And in his brigades, he had West Africans from Mali, Niger, and these countries. They ended up forming the group called Mujao, M-U-J-A-O, or Movement for Unity and Jihad in West Africa. The Nigerians under Bel Mukhtar ended up forming with Ansaru. So, and, and I've highlighted here on this map, just to give you an overview, those red circles are Ansaru operations or operations in coordination with Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb affiliates. So Ansaru is like a typical Sahelian terror or, or terrorist group anywhere. It carries out spot attacks. Boko Haram, in contrast, carries out attacks on a near daily basis. Ansaru's attacks are mostly targeted at foreigners or Nigerian military that has connections to foreigners. For example, when Nigeria was about to send troops to Mali to support the French intervention, Ansaru attacked the troops heading to Mali. Most of Ansaru's attacks, though, have been kidnapping the foreigners, which reflects its training under Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb from 2003 to 2013. And the leaders of Ansaru all were in Algeria or Mauritania at some point in the mid to late 2000s. You can even see two of those red circles in Niger, because Ansaru members were involved in the attacks that Mukhtar Bel Mukhtar's brigades had in Arlet and Agadez earlier this year. And there's one red circle on the very top of this map, which is in Aminas, Algeria, because Nigerians connected to Ansaru were also operating there as well. The rest of those little red circles are in Nigeria, mostly kidnappings of foreigners, of which the results are, have always been bad. Uh, they generally kill their hostages um, because it doesn't appear they're after money so much as ideological and political purposes. Um, and the three circles there, you see one that says 2012 AO, one that says 2011 AO, and one that says 2013 AO. In fact, in 2013, Boko Haram's area of operations has contracted. That's largely because the Mali intervention uh, disconnected Boko Haram from some of its key funders, weapons, and weapons and training sources in Mali and Niger, and therefore the groups contracted. At the same time, uh, it's become more violent, even in a smaller area of operations. And, and one important point I'd like to say is that even though the 2012 area of operations looks really big for Boko Haram, some of those operations in northwestern Nigeria may really have been closer to Ansaru than actually Boko Haram. And that's just a distinction that analysts like myself are still beginning to realize and flesh out. After all, the name Boko Haram is a name that we ascribe to it. Boko Haram's real name is Jamatu Ahli Sunni Li Dawati Wal Jihad. And uh, so a lot of times when any attack is carried out in Nigeria, they say it's Boko Haram, but really it might be different factions, such, such as Ansaru. So just to move quickly through some, some additional slides to give perspective. Uh, Ansaru was placed on the UK terror list before Boko Haram, first in 2012. This was because Ansaru kidnapped and killed a British and Italian hostage taken from northwest Nigeria. They kidnapped them in 2011 and uh, killed them during a uh, res rescue attempt in, in uh, early 2012. At the time that Ansaru carried out this kidnapping in 2011, it used the name Al-Qaeda in the lands beyond the Sahel, reflecting its Al-Qaeda influence. It may have changed its name to Ansaru because of the advice from Abdel Malik Dukdal, the leader of Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb, 
who encouraged affiliates not to be so obviously tied to Al-Qaeda because it would draw attention. Uh, just an example of the Ansaru Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb connection. The GSPC was the predecessor to the Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb, the group Salafis pour le combat, pour le propagation et le combat. Um, and you can see that there's similar logos. They both use the sun, for example. And when a Boko Haram courier was captured by Nigeria early this year, and a very key courier he was, he said that we got funding from the group from the sun, sunset, which to me reflects how Ansaru and the GSPC are all very linked, you know, superficially with the logos as well as the intel that can be gleaned from interrogations. Moreover, Ansaru propaganda materials were found at Mukhtar Belmukhtar's compound in Gao Mali after he fled that city in early 2012, or early 2013. Um, and, and again, just some of the imagery, you see Ansaru fighters tend to wear these Sahelian uh, turbans, as in the photo with the British and the Italian hostage. Later, um, Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb, as well as Ansaru elements, can have the German in Kano, Michael City. None of them survived rescue attempts. Uh, and here's just an example of a recent video that Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar released of his attacks in Niger, where an Ansaru fighter comes on video and says he's an Ansaru fighter from Nigeria. And this is uh, the lone captive of Ansaru who still remains captive. And Ansaru says that they won't release him until France and Nigeria stop their craziness. Ansaru, of course, is more Francophone affiliated, Boko Haram more Anglophone, because Boko Haram is Nigeria affiliated, and Nigeria is an English speaking country. Uh, and Ansaru is closely tied with the French speaking Sahelian countries. And there are, and this is my final slide, just to say that Boko Haram's leader, Abu Bakr Shakal, he, you know, he has also been throughout the region, even though Ni Boko Haram is Nigeria based. It's mostly based in Borno State in the northeast of Nigeria. And this is a Boko Haram propaganda video showing itself carrying out an attack in Bama near the Chad, Niger, and Cameroonian borders, and then holding up the Islamic flag at a tank that it captured. OK, those are just my uh, introductory remarks. And uh, thank you for that. And I look forward to further discussion with Claire and, and Michael. Thanks, Jake. Um, I'm going to start, first of all, with some basic um, internal questions, internal to Nigeria. And I noticed, Jake, that you focused a lot on Ansaru. But for now, um, it will probably get back to that group. Um, but for now, I want to focus on Boko Haram. Um, and if I could ask uh, the gen you gentlemen to uh, try to limit your, your answers to five minutes, because we have a lot of questions to get through. And I want to make sure that our audience has time as well to ask questions. All right, so the first question I want to ask is directed towards Michael. Um, Michael, uh, as you, you probably know, Nigeria was known as one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Um, and the population has expressed grievances against the government in terms of lack of infrastructure, lack of delivery of basic services. How much do you think this has contributed to the development of Boko Haram? Yeah. I, thank you for, for having me. And I'm very happy to be here. Uh, we all know that yes, the, the issue of corruption in Nigeria is is more of a as old name, and uh, apart from even radical organizations, many many Nigerians are also worried about the trend of corruption, both in government and in all facets of our lives. In fact, it has affected almost everything that has to do with it was as a nation. And that's why um, when the group like Boko Haram came around claiming to um, to grant the derail of corruption, majority of um, many Nigerians were more of them like receiving, they want to receive what the message they have because it's like they are like messiahs when they came. 
with the message of you know, trying to uh, resolve the issue of corruption. But as time goes on, it became something that is not, I could not say corruption is not uh, a driver to, to radicalization in Nigeria. It is, but it's not the only uh, factor. But the issue of educated youth is also one of the drivers of regulation in Nigeria. Youth unemployment, which we can also tie to the issue of corruption, issue of unemployment, and even development between North and South. I think these are the main issue. And that's why when group like uh, Boko Haram came around, they were like, the majority of people in the of Nigeria was like, let's see how we can go. And when it became very violent and killing almost everybody. Because I remember the, the first strike in Kano, that was in January 2012. About a few hours before the, before the strike, there are leaflets sharing all over the place that we are only after the government, the Christians, and secret agencies. But when the ships were down, the majority of the casualties are the Al Safinis, are the Muslims. And it's like the, the tide of the thing has torn. And that's why people are now worrying that are we sure this group are the same group that are attacking us? But the issue of corruption in Nigeria is, is, is it, it, has, it has affected everything. And that's why when we have different groups like Boko Haram, People can accept them because we, they were like the ones to see how they can write the issue of uh, leadership corruption in Nigeria, issue of um, unemployment, issue of youth exclusion in politics. And they were able to, to catalyze on the issue of geopolitical situation in Nigeria, the issue between North and South, the issue between Christian and Muslims. And these are the issues. They were able to catalyze on that. But how far could they go? We, we, we have seen that, yes, we are not here to do what Islam and the tenet of Islam teaches. Because they are not representing the identity of, the, of Islam, Muslim in Northern Nigeria. It's, Michael, it's a group, it's, I, it's a very minute sector of people. Can I interrupt really quickly? Um, yes. Uh, could you move your microphone a little bit away from your mouth so that uh, it's more, it's clearer? Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, that's perfect. And I want to remind my speakers to perfect. I want to remind my speakers to uh, to speak slowly and clearly. Um, so basically, what I get from your answer is that you're saying that uh, corruption and the lack of uh, and basically the the relative deprivation and grievances ex expressed by Nigerians um, is one of the motivating issues. Um, yes. Uh, Jacob, do you have any comment on that as well? Um, yeah, I agree with Michael. I think whether you look at the Niger Delta insurgents in the south of the country, or whether you look at other ethnic insurgents, somehow corruption fills into it some fills into the equation somehow. For one, a lot of attacks by Boko Haram as well as other insurgents okay. are based on inside jobs, meaning that people in the military military or government help the insurgents to do it, either for money or because they sympathize with them. In addition, in Boko Haram's propaganda, even before it became a militant group, it would say to the people, why are we part of this country? You know, they're really rich, they get oil money from the south, it ends up trickling down through government officials and whatnot, and then nothing comes to us. We don't even get government services. So why are we going to show loyalty to this country? Why don't we just do what we did before this country of Nigeria existed in 1960. And, and in particular, where Boko Haram is based in northeast Nigeria, in Borno, they're the least, they're the most excluded from this sort of petrocracy or oil money system. So, so they know that they come from a rich country. And at the same time, they know that they get nothing of it. So why do they have loyalty? Especially one other point is Boko Haram's area of operations borders Niger, Chad, and Cameroon and many of their ancestors come from Sudan, and they used to belong to a caliphate in Central Africa. 
So, I mean, a lot of their you know, social cultural connections are actually not even to Abuja at all. And Lagos is like another world. So if, the, if they don't see the government impacting their daily life in a positive way, they're not likely to have much loyalty to the government. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, Michael, uh, what, uh, so as uh, for our listeners, Nigeria um, is one of the states or countries in Africa that has a federal system. Um, so the, the country is organized politically into states. Um, what threat do you think Boko Haram poses to the federal system in Nigeria? Yes, the, the threat of Boko Haram to the federal system or federal government in Nigeria is very enormous. And it also goes beyond that. Even the sub-Saharan region, because Nigeria, Nigeria is a very crucial factor in West Africa and in Africa in particular. And if you look at Nigeria, with a population of, of, of more than 160 million, and with over 70 million Muslims, I think it's, it's a very, it has a very strong implications, not only to Nigeria, but to the Islamic world. And that's why the issue of religion in Nigeria, where we have north and south almost at par in terms of Christian and Muslims. And that's why groups like Boko Haram were able to tap onto that grievances between and that dakota between north and south and Christian and Muslims to divide Nigeria more. Because they know in the geopolitical system of Nigeria, the issue of politics, religion is a very vital element. And that's why they capitalize on that. And Beside that, issue of trade, Nigeria, maybe Nigeria in particular, is very, very vital to the level of countries like Nigeria, Chad, and Cameroon. Because we know, like in Cameroon, over 15 billion uh, worth of trade annually, and over 2 billion people across the borders coming to trade in Nigeria. But with the issue of Boko Haram, no one is trying to, to take the risk of coming because you, you are not sure of your, of your safety, not to talk of coming to trade. And this has really affected the, uh, the issue of trade in, in West Africa because Nigeria is a force in West Africa. And the issue of the insecurity is a very crucial one for us. And that's why not only even uh, traders are not coming, but businesses are moving from Nigeria to other parts of the country and to even to other global nations like Ghana. And this is a very uh, serious issue that needs to be tackled. And I think we have to know that, yes, even the international uh, jihadists, global jihadists, they also see Nigeria as a recruiting center where they can recruit all of their news, all of the created news. So they are all selfish interest and moving that Nigeria we, we, we are very religious people and with religion we can do anything and that's why even our leaders, the political leaders, are using religion to divide us more. And that is what we are seeing happening now in Nigeria. Great. All right. So as I understand you're you're saying it's it it is affecting federalism um, as well as trade, so economic economic strength of Nigeria and the Western Africa region. Um, Jacob, I have a, a quick question. Um, Professor Ali Masri, um, a, a well-known scholar, has said that uh, the quest in Islam is, uh, or the identitarian quest in Islam is a driving force in Boko Haram's insurgency. Um, and it's fact it's coupled with the Norse loss of power. Um, as as our audience may know, um, Muslims, uh, Nigeria's uh, religious um, uh, religions are nearly divided. Almost 50% Muslim, 50% Christian. Um, those numbers aren't exact, but very close. So uh, most of the Muslims are in the north. Most of the Christians are in the south. So Jake, do you think? Um, how important 
um, is uh, this uh, Islamic quest um, a part, or how much is it a part of the Norse loss of political power? I think you know, I think it's important to remember that Boko Haram formed in 2009 when a Muslim was actually president of Nigeria. And it was President Yara Adua who mm. promised to crush Boko Haram. He killed Boko Haram's leader and 1,000 of its members and arrested lots of others. So actually Boko Haram formed under Muslim leadership. Um, and I think the nuance to understand, in my opinion, <clears throat> and, and that I think deserves further research, is that Boko Haram's base in Borno State is a majority Kanuri ethnic state. And the way I see it is that the religious political networks that benefit from Nigeria's wealth are mostly Hausa ethnic based in the Northwest. And I don't think that the Muslim, Christian, political, demo democratic, whatever networks filter well into the Borno ethnic Kanuri area where Boko Haram's based. And all of Boko Haram's leaders have been ethnic Kanuris, not Hausas, who are the majority. So I would argue that Boko Haram is m marginalized in the sense that it doesn't benefit from these religious political networks. And uh, so I don't think it's so much just a North-South, you know, predominantly Muslim North, predominantly Christian South, and that political power fell to the Christian South. I think it's really that the, the, the economic oil network just don't get to this Boko Haram area in Maiduguri, Borno State. And that's why they're rebelling, not just against the Christians, but really they're rebelling against the traditional Muslim leadership in northern Nigeria, more than even the Christians, more than even the United States, um, and more than anyone else. OK, thank you for clarifying that. Um, Let's move a little bit more towards outside of the uh, political, broader political science realm and more towards some of the tactics that Boko Haram uses. Um, as, as was mentioned earlier, Boko Haram um, is going after what we would refer to uh, as soft targets, so civilians. Um, the recent attack on a school um, is a good example of this. Um, so my, you know, one question would be, why um, does Boko Haram go after so soft targets? Usually insurgents focus on uh, attacking government entities. So uh, Michael, what do you, can you, can you tell us why Boko Haram goes after uh, civilians? Um, I think if you look at the trend of events uh, from 2011 to date, you find that it's like uh, uh, the, the group is now disjointed. And we also have various uh, factions. And let me tell you, let you know that even just like what James said earlier on, most of the attacks may not be by Boko Haram because now we can have like four, five factions or types of Boko Haram in Nigeria. We have the political Boko Haram, we have the criminal programs that the gang, and we have the religious Boko Haram, and we have those that want to settle probably a uh, personal vendetta or scores using the same tactics of Boko Haram. So it may not be Boko Haram doing what, what is happening, but because let me give you the instance in one of them in Kano, where the NDC, uh, two of the members of the uh, parliament were killed. And it was not Boko Haram, it was to certain scores. The attack on the enemy of Kano, a very prominent ruler in Kano that was so respected all over the Nigeria and in the world, was also attacked. And this is not, you can't say this is Boko Haram. It looks I like think we've, we've, the political, we've the political class, the, the criminals, and robbers, they use this uh, as, as, as a way of the cover up. And that's why. Of Boko Haram. Not to say Boko Haram are not there. They are there doing what they are doing also, just to cause dissatisfaction among Nigerians. Between the North and South, between the Christians and Muslims. Here. I remember a little bit of time in December, we were I, giving uh, uh, if the I, Christians in the North were giving one week, seven days, to leave Northern Nigeria. 
So it looks like that Michael's uh, yeah. broadcast but was, all the way from Nigeria is coming in a little bit slowly. So Michael, if we can ask you to sort of mute your microphone for now and we'll get back to you. Um, in the meantime, Jacob, if you could answer, you know, sort of talk about the um, the, the tactics that uh, that Boko Haram is, mm -hmm. is using against civilians. Well, you know, if we look at the recent school attack, and it's a total confusion, so solved as a pressure to cause uh, in the past three months, Boko Haram has carried out uh, two major school attacks in Yobe State, so which is next. To Borno State. Get Borno State is the main base of Boko Haram. To see in I both attacks, they killed about 50 students. <clears throat> now, one thing that I <clears throat> is interesting is we call them I civilians because in our because they are civilians. But the Boko Haram, but when the tide of things now yeah. change, everybody is not in attack. There's no one that is safe now. Even for northern Nigeria, we don't, you cannot even say it openly that Boko Haram cannot be, you can't mention it because everybody is afraid. Yeah. Hi, Claire, go ahead. We're going to try and get. Sorry about that, folks. Jacob, go ahead. Okay, first of all, <clears throat> um, when we're talking about civilians being killed in Yobe State, such as students of a university, in Boko Haram's mind, they are not civilians because they are apostates, because they are accepting Western education, they are accepting English language education. Anyone who attends an English language school will not support Boko Haram in the first place. So it's not like Boko Haram is losing support from people that might support it. I think there's a very limited base of people who actually support it. And in carrying out these attacks in Yobe State, where it has killed basically everybody in an entire dormitory, uh, it's merely uh, operating based on its ideological motive, which is to deter people from accepting Western education. When Boko Haram was a propaganda group or a preaching group from 2002 to 2009, its two core principles that differed from other Salafists was one, that Western education was prohibited, and two, that service in the secular government was prohibited. By killing people who obtained secular government and uh, secular education and killing people who serve in the government, Boko Haram is deterring them from violating Boko Haram ideology. And some people are brainwashed to believe that is correct. Great, thank you for that. Um, our next question, um, so a little bit sort of going outside of, of Nigeria and as far as Boko Haram's and, and Saru's uh, international relations, how much, um, it, it claims to be affiliated with Al-Qaeda, but does Al Qaeda actually recognize Boko Haram as a legitimate extension of its, its organization? I think, in fact, Al Qaeda rejects Boko Haram. If you take a look at some of the leading Al Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb propagandists, they talk about strategies, for example, to deal with people who obtain secular West, who obtain secular education in school. And a couple months ago, Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb released a sort of a strategy towards dealing with this. And their strategy was clear that you don't just go to the school and kill everybody. That'll make you lose local support. You'll never, you'll never uh, gain popularity, and you'll never become the political movement that Al-Qaeda wants. Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb recommends that you send you know, letters to families who send their kids to these schools, warning them about this first before you consider taking action. Or you can just burn down the school at night, which Boko Haram does sometimes. But Boko Haram's sheer violence is something that, especially against Muslims, is something that Al-Qaeda is trying to 
stop doing so much. And this Al-Shabaab attack in Nairobi two weeks ago was an example where they tried not to kill Muslims okay. so much. Well, um, and, and although Boko Haram leader Abu Shakao... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yes? Oh, well, quick question in relation to... But yeah, Al-Qaeda has not recognized Boko Haram. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's interesting because um, there's a lot of claims that, it, that, it, that they make that they are affiliated. Um, and in, re in regards to Al-Shabaab, um, uh, what uh, there are some assertions that it is trying to link itself with Al-Shabaab. Is that, is that true, Jacob? Right. Well, I think affiliations can exist on mul multiple levels. For example, in Boko Haram propaganda videos, it'll often show leaders of Al-Shabaab, particularly Abdi Godane, who who is believed to have carried out that attack in Nairobi. So it wants to be seen, I believe, as sort of another African terrorist insurgent group um, like Al-Shabaab. And in terms of affiliation with Al-Qaeda, I don't doubt that you know, smuggling networks of arms and weapons have gone from Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb to Boko Haram. But in terms of an, a formal affiliation, in terms of Al-Qaeda Central or Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb saying, this is our Nigerian group, I think they've opted to stay away from Boko Haram on that level because it's a big risk because it doesn't seem to follow the evolving modus operandi of Al Qaeda. Ansaru is actually more, you know, of a byproduct of Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. In that respect, um, one of our one of our listeners is asking um, whether there are Al Shabaab operatives present in Nigeria. And I was wondering, Michael, um, if you could, welcome back, by the way, and if you could speak uh, slowly, um, if, uh, if you can answer that question. Does Al-Shabaab have operatives present in Nigeria? Uh, just a moment. Let me see if we can get him back online. We've had some uh, sound issues uh, all the way from Nigeria. Uh, Michael, are you able to hear me? Test, test. Stand by, folks. Are you able to hear us? Jacob, why don't you go ahead and answer that question? Okay. Um, re regarding the question about Al-Shabaab in Nigeria, um, there may be very few couriers or operatives who have moved from Nigeria to Somalia to Algeria to Yemen to Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Sudan. But it's clearly not, I don't think it's more than a dozen. I think there are very select few Shabab operatives who have provided, however, very key expertise in bomb making that has helped Boko Haram carry out some of its more dramatic attacks. Because mostly Boko Haram's attacks are simple you know, relatively simple assassination or burning down of schools or churches. Um, but some of the more spectacular attacks that carried out in 2012 were largely due to the greater expertise it received from abroad, including from Al-Shabaab. Small scale, but large impact. Okay, well, in, in that light, um, another listener is asking, uh, what's really responsible for the shift in strategy from suicide bombers to things like vehicle-borne IEDs, uh, imp improvised explosive devices, um, to shifting to attack attacks by actual gunmen. Um, is this a response to uh, operational problems, um, or is this a response to uh, the Nigerian government's um, beginning to, to, to fight Boko Haram, what do you think? I think that Boko Haram is very strong and is very based in northeastern Nigeria, in Borno State. Now, in 2012, you saw about you know, 15 to 20 suicide bombings across the center of the country, including the northwest. At that time, a lot of people thought what was happening in northwest Nigeria was Boko Haram. In fact, I don't believe it was this grassroots Boko Haram group that carries out relatively simple attacks. I think what happened in 2012 
is that al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb, Ansaru, and other Islamist militants abroad started feeding expertise and money into the middle belt of Nigeria, where there is pre-existing Muslim Christian tensions, and that's why you saw you know, more suicide bombings in Kaduna and Jas and Abuja at the UN headquarters. And this was all out of Boko Haram's main area of operations. We may have called it Boko Haram, but I think there was something different at play, such as international Islamists trying to penetrate Nigeria. And I think we don't see that so much this year because of what happened in Mali. And Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb had to retreat towards North Africa, like Tunisia and, and Libya. And I, don't, and I think a lot of those networks have been cut off because a lot of Boko Haram Nigerian couriers were killed or arrested. So I don't think Boko Haram is getting that expertise and that funding and that material to the middle belt okay. of the country. Michael, uh, what is your response to that question? Um, why has Boko Haram's tactics shifted from, um, uh, from soft targets, from, um, from using uh, IEDs uh, and to more um, military operations, more aggressive operations? If you could put your microphone on, Michael, that'd be great. Hold on, Michael. Uh, yep, hold on. Uh, folks, if you can just uh, indulge us just a moment, uh, we're going to try and get uh, Michael Sound back on. Let me see if I can help uh, flag him in. Uh, Michael, uh, are you able to hear us? Yes? Okay, great. Uh, make sure you click on the microphone icon at the top of your screen. Good. Uh, do the audio setup lizard and make sure your headphone is selected. And while you're doing that, as soon as you have uh, audio, try to do the microphone. And while we're doing that, Claire, if you would go ahead and continue, uh, continue on. Uh, Michael, uh, as soon as you have audio, give me a test. and. Uh, then we'll bring you back into the discussion. This is great because it shows uh, the difficulty in operating from some of these places as those of us who have, uh, who have worked in there and what Michael deals with on a daily basis. Um, so I guess the next question um, uh, comes from our, our CKC director, Mr. Carl Prinslow. He's asking, uh, is Boko Haram's objective, as we, as we discussed before, the objective was really um, to cleanse Nigeria of Western education. Um, is, its object, is its objective now an independent Islamic state, or is it more about conversion um, to Islam? Um, yeah, and first, uh, I do agree it's, it's uh, upsetting about Michael, but I, I do know he will be in Washington, um, D.C. later this year, so people will have an opportunity to meet him in person, and I hope to myself. Um, regarding Boko Haram's uh, objectives, I think what's very interesting is we have this paradigm saying just because it's a jihadist group, it wants an Islamic state. But actually, even before 2009, I don't believe Boko Haram was really envisioning becoming a government and creating an Islamic state, although it admired the Taliban. So even now, I don't think it's trying to set up an Islamic state, uh, at least not its primary goal. I think what it's really trying to do, consistent with its traditional ideology, is one, deter people from attending secular schools by trying to burn them all down or killing people, and two, trying to deter people from serving in the government by killing anyone or their family who serves in the government. Even when Boko Haram has seized some local government areas in Borno State, it didn't start setting up you know, governmental systems and humanitarian relief like Al-Shabaab. It's strictly right now Use, it used to focus ideolog ideologically about saying, don't go to Western schools, don't serve in the government, and now it's just operationalizing its ideology. Uh, at some point, I, I suppose, it would try to put religious leaders associated with Boko Haram in place. But at this stage of Boko Haram's development, it's strictly de deterrence, elimination of its enemy ideas. And we'll see if it ever tries to move to government. Okay, um, and as I understand, Michael's still trying to uh, figure uh, to come back on to have his sound come back on. But in the meantime, um, the question let's let's look a little bit about outside uh, outside Nigeria. 
um, is Boko Haram sort of, or, you know, I, I understand that it has several factions, um, is, uh, is Boko Haram seeking to become more of an international organization? One thing that's also interesting about the Boko Haram faction, the main Boko Haram faction that's in northeastern Nigeria, it has had plenty of opportunities to carry out attacks, at least in Niger, Cameroon, and Chad, because it has had bases there for at least two, three, if not more years. But yet, 99.8% of Boko Haram attacks have been in Nigeria or in Borno State. So it seems like the group is exercising strict discipline not to carry out attacks in Niger, Chad, and Cameroon or further abroad. Uh, and one reason might be because if it starts aggravating Niger or Cameroon, then those countries will be forced to crack down on Boko Haram elements that have bases in those neighboring countries. At the same time, you have had Nigerians in Mali and in Niger who have carried out attacks with Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb and its affiliates, such as Mukhtar Bel Mukhtar's brigade. But that was not really the Boko, main Boko Haram faction in Borno State, like I should have. This was more Ansaru or Ansaru connected element. Can um, you know? Hi. Pardon the interruption. Uh, mm -hmm. Looks like we've got uh, Michael back in. Uh, Michael, go ahead and kick on your camera and uh, go ahead and mute your microphone now that we've got you working. Can you hear me now? Yes, Michael, uh, we've got you. Can you hear us? Yes, yes. Great. Okay. Uh, Can you hear me? Great, fantastic. If you would move your microphone away from your mouth a little bit. Just pull it away. There you go. Actually, that's great. Okay. Perfect. Let's, let's uh, since Michael, okay. that's pretty far. Great. <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, I'm back. That, uh, <laughs> sorry about my. Sorry about all that, Michael. Um, let's let's direct the next question to you. And thanks, Jacob, for for addressing that and sort of taking over for a bit. Um, Michael, where where does Boko Haram and its factions get its resources? Where is it getting its weapons? Oh, well, looking at where they are getting their resources. I think it's, it's uh, from different sources, but from local and international sources. Uh, from the local sources, we can look out for the, for the politicians who want to uh, win election by all, at all costs. And probably the international source looking at the, the at Canada, the Maghreb, and some sources maybe in, the, uh, in Iran or in Saudi Arabia, and some part of elements in uh, Somalia at Shabab. Because oftentimes, when, when they, in, in our videos, that we, because we, they always communicate to us through YouTube, through, through video, because we don't know, nobody is coming out to say, I'm a member of Boko Haram. So through their video, uh, YouTube uh, messages, they always lay claim to uh, sources from international sources, like Al Shaba, like from uh, Al Qaeda in the Maghreb, and some other sources. But we also know that, yes, there are some elements within the local political class that are funding them to probably to cause political dissertations in Nigeria. But this is, nobody can say this is a person that is doing it because their operations is absolute, is done in absolute secrecy. Nobody, in fact, for now, no one can, except even because even the government, when we talk of um, establishing the, the dialogue committee to talk about uh, to dialogue with the book of members. Nobody is coming out. Even those that are coming out, uh, the fashion of book are coming out, other people will say, no, they are not speaking for us. So who do we talk to? And to talk of the issue of sources, we also know that even they also do bank robberies, like in the early days, because now it's not easy to do bank robbery again. They do bank robbery to get uh, funds to fund their operations, and they also need um, uh, security uh, police stations to get ammunition, which is not possible now because the uh, operation of the GTF in the three states where they have a serious presence 
due to the uh, the emergency operations okay. is very very difficult for them and even now the local populations are also after them okay. the is ready to ask anybody who is Boko Ramonga like I know very well in Kano it's very very difficult for even any house or maybe landlord to rent his house to Boko Haram member because if you do that and if government should know your house will be demolished and because most people don't want their house to be demolished they have to know who they are renting their house to and that's why now is one you can time. find that they are on the road. If Thank we could you. ask you to slow, thanks, Michael. If we could ask you to slow down a bit when you answer, um, I think okay. our audience. I think I'm very passionate about, about that. that. Okay. Um, uh, in the same vein, Michael, uh, what would you say to the suggestion that prior to its first engagement, um, Boko Haram was already creating religious enclaves in Bornu and providing services? objective to create a state um, so can you comment on uh, its its service provision to the local population was that ever going on can you come, in, come again come again sure. um, the question is did Boko Haram ever start to provide services such as health care um, any sort of provisional services that, that a state would provide as part of a social contract? You're shaking your head. <laughs> Can you no, 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 nothing like that. Instead of that, what they are doing is to even take away from the, from the local people. Um, True raping of women, robbing, and doing all sorts of daily things. So that's, I think that's the irony of you coming out as a messiah and instead of doing good, you are even worsening the situation for the people of us. And that's why every body now in modern Nigeria, I can tell you, both Muslims and Christians, every body is out to see how this problem can be resolved. Okay. Um what uh, one of our listeners is asking, um, and let's let's turn to Jacob for this question. What is the Niger Nigerian government doing to differentiate between uh, the Muslim, the 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 persecution of Boko Haram, with the rest of the Nigerian Muslim community? And I would be interested in knowing how they're 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 messaging that to specifically the Muslim population. I think it's a major challenge, uh, as Dr. Medelitz or anyone who's researched insurgencies would know, to differentiate the insurgents from the local population, especially because Boko Haram is among the local population, and sometimes it will pay money to young boys that don't attend school, that are like Quranic students or Arabic religious students, and tell them, go burn down a school. So. I mean, are you going to go kill that boy and then anger his friends? Boko Haram has been hiding in the middle of cities. Um, so, you know, they're, they're not wearing uniforms. And I don't think that Nigeria has effectively been able to distinguish who's a Boko Haram member and who's not in every case. And this is what has led some local people to be alienated by Boko Haram as well as the government. But I do think Boko Haram is trying to establish safe havens by just killing any government official in certain remote areas. And in those places, Boko Haram just roams around freely. And no government officials, civilians, or anyone wants to go there. But it allows Boko Haram to train. So it's a very complex issue. And I think uh, Nigerians that I speak with in the, military, in the security feel they need some support or best practice scenarios. And I think this is an area of possible coordination between the US, who has got a lot of experience in this, and Nigeria, or the UK, or other countries. OK. And in that regard, this is a good segue into uh, talking about um, how to address Boko Haram, both by the Nigerian government and by the international community. So I'm going to direct this question to Michael. Um, how would you, as the leader and coordinator of a, a, an NGO 
that focuses on uh, peace and conflict resolution, how would you suggest the Nigerian government go about uh, resolving this, this crisis? One of the major area of ways of tackling this menace is to use what I call soft power. Instead of using brute force, brute force by the uh, security operatives, they should use more of intelligence operations. And this way, I will talk of saying support from Nigerian partners all over the world because our security operatives they need to be to, to be trained on how to tackle this this issue because it's a foreign uh, something to us that we don't know how to tackle and that's why the issue of extrajudicial killings issue of torture will not work but it has to be something that has to do with um, intelligence gathering with local population. Again, we have to look okay. at issue of development mm -hmm. in the north. Mm -hmm. I think there should be extensive development in the north. Issue of education too should be looked into. Youth unemployment should be tackled. And the issue of corruption, as I've said, should be tackled. And we, uh, uh, what we call the moderate Muslims, should be, they should be encouraged to come out and to speak out. Because we all know that this group are not representing the Muslims in Nigeria. The Muslims in Nigeria, they are peace loving people. So, for the government to tackle this, they need to reach out to the Muslim element, the moderate elements among the Muslim communities, the traditional rulers, and the local populations, even the non-governmental organizations that are well established in the North, should be encouraged. Got it. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Jake, and, and sort of in, uh, Parallel to that question, um, tangentially, what uh, is part of a soft as a part of a soft power um, strategy, as as Michael has suggested by the Nigerian government? Mm. How can the government, or perhaps uh, governments uh, in the country surrounding Nigeria, counter um, the messaging that Boko Haram is disseminating to the public? Mm. Right. Um, I, I think you know one, one great point Michael made amongst all of his points, which are really on target, and he's really bringing in the local perspective, so we can understand how to combat Boko Haram without trying to hammer each and every one of them, which we can't do. Um, one thing Michael noted was intel, and actually, when you look at Boko Haram's area of operations, that 2012 to 2011 shift, it's not because the security forces killed a lot of people. When when you see their contracting area of operations. It's because they arrested key individuals by gaining key intelligence and cutting off these networks. And that is um, very low impact on the civilian people, but yet very high impact in terms of uh, destroying Boko Haram's spread. So I think intel is key, as Michael noted. And that requires having people listening on the ground and, and getting along well with um, local people in Kano who report on Boko Haram. Um, and then in terms of the regional issue, just like the US and Afghanistan cannot get rid of the Taliban, as long as it can run into Pakistan. Nigeria cannot get rid of Boko Haram as long as it can run into Niger, Cameroon, and Chad. And it's very clear that Boko Haram continues to do that. And that's why there needs to be a better regional coordination, cooperation, and mechanism to stop this at the border of Nigeria. And, and then you know, third, in terms of uh, stopping the Boko Haram recruitment and ideology, I think you need to look at Boko Haram recruitment patterns. And if you look at who's getting recruited and why they're getting recruited, you'll start noticing certain patterns. And it might not be in every case that the, uh, the local grassroots members are loving this ideology. But there might be some other reasons like familial issues or monetary incentives. And you need to find who's vulnerable and learn ways to cut them off. 
And then on the other end, there is an intellectual basis to Boko Haram uh, based on its ideology. And you, and you need to counter that by, you know, a, appealing to other narratives. And that's where, you know, someone like Michael can really help. But, you know, the one narrative that can hopefully win is this one that says, if Boko Haram has some issues with Nigeria, you know, killing lots of people is not the solution. There might be other solutions, whether they want autonomy or whatnot. But killing everybody is not, not the way. But I think Michael's you know, best poised to focus okay. on that. And, and that's interesting, the point you make about how um, there's various um, dynamics to Boko Haram. There's an intellectual dynamic. There is a religious dynamic. There is a dynamic that addresses grievances and, as Michael said, addresses lack of infrastructure and services. I know this was specifically the case when um, when I myself was doing research in Afghanistan on the Taliban, and there were various types of people who joined for various reasons, for revenge, mm. because they needed employment, because they believed in the religious ideology, mm. and uh, or the intellectual part of it. So um, I think that's a, a very mm. important point to, to emphasize, is that there's not just one homogenous Boko Haram member. Right, they're, it, they're all different. Um, and, and in my opinion, we sometimes portray them as stupid or something. But you know, I've listened to their sermons translated from Hausa or Kanuri, and the, you know, they do have an intellectual basis. They do understand history. Even their current leader, Shakao, who's depicted as a madman. In, in fact, if you look at his sermons from when the group was not militant. I mean, he, he's really trying to bring intellectual arguments, and we need to challenge it on that level as well as the local one. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I also want to add to that. I want to add to add that uh, apart from doing what the government is doing, the local NGOs in Nigeria, especially in northern Nigeria, are doing great job to counter and to mitigate these demands. Just like our program, uh, we have what we call the Peace Club program for young people in northern Nigeria, which I, I'm sure I have the slides. If time permits, I can maybe flip through. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Peace Club right project, right. yes, the Peace Club project is for the young people. Looking at uh, young people from both the Muslim communities and from the Christian communities. And what we do, it was founded in 2006 for young people, 50 members. But now, I'll tell you, we have over 8,000 members in four states in Nigeria. Our programs, we have two hours weekly peace education program and sports session, football, basketball for young people. These are the members, you can see them on the slides. We do this to mitigate the, uh, the, the recruiting element of Boko Haram. And how do we do that? It's through schools. We also train instructors in schools to work with young people as peace club instructors. Every year, we, we celebrate the International Day of Peace just to send the message of peace over Nigeria. You can see our members in their various regalias, both from the north, from the south. These are some of the activities of bringing more people together from the north, from the south, Christian Muslims, to change their mindset, to, to embrace themselves, and see themselves as well Nigerians and to see themselves as a global citizen that uh, transcend religion, ethnic, or cultural differences. And these are what we're doing in modern Nigeria to mitigate the effect of Boko Haram. Great. This, it seems like a wonderful project, and it seems like uh, the, the grassroots or the indigenous uh, solutions, I think, are are the way to go because uh, if it's imposed from outside, 
um, then it, it's really not going to take root. Um, I think it needs to be helped by outsiders, but um, it definitely needs to come from the local the local people. Um, uh, I, I want to start to wrap up a little bit. What I do want to mention is that um, if you have questions that have not been answered, you can email them. Um, Jay, if you could put the email up in the chat box, that'd be great. Um, or, and, and we can get them to our speakers and they can address them. I also want to reiterate uh, or uh, mention again that Michael is, is going to be in Washington, D.C. in the beginning of December. So if any of you are based in Washington, D.C., um, thank you for that, Jay, uh, then, and, and would like to speak with Michael in person, um, perhaps that can be something that can be arranged. Um, and Jacob is also based in Washington, D.C., so um, perhaps we can get another sort of informal discussion going with some, uh, with some, better, no, no, no. some yeah. better audio. Great. Um, so if I could have just some last comments from, uh, from our, our panelists, um, that would be wonderful. Uh, let's keep it short and sweet, and, um, and then we'll take it back to Jay. Michael, why don't you go first? Microphone. Yes, I would just, just say that Nigerians we are resolved in unison to tackle this menace of um, extreme radicalization in Nigeria. And because we find that it's, it's not something that has to do with religion, it's not something that has to do with our tribes, it's, it's a strange element. And I'm very sure we are resolved to come together to solve this strange atmosphere in Nigeria. And I'll tell you, Nigeria, we know how to tackle our issues, we know how to do our things. What we just need is encouragement and support from our international partners and to see how we can add a headway so that our country will come back and become a, a, a country as it is made in, 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 in the days where it was, where it was, was um, when it came to be. And this is the message we are passing that uh, I, I, I'm from the South. I live in the north. I've lived almost all my life in the north. And that's why we have people who are also in the north, living in the south. We have, we have intermarriages that cannot be broken. So Nigerians will remain well. And that is all what we are praying for and what we are working towards. Thank you. Jacob, go ahead. Uh, my, my final comment would be that, you know, with people like Michael on the ground at Kano and, and others like him and his vast network and his commitment to this problem, if we're committed to this problem and we team up with people like Michael, we can likely make a big impact. And there is the emerging field of countering violent extremism, or CBE, which is intended to tackle groups like Boko Haram on the ideological level, on the local level, on the narrative level. Um, in, in all different ways. And, and it's all about teaming up and establishing a broad network of people committed to the same goal of limiting its influence, reducing it, and eventually stamping it out. So I look forward to collaborating with you, Michael, and, and Claire, and everybody else in the future, as soon as possible, actually. 